Good evening and welcome to the Mary Magdalene Apostle Catholic Community Lenten Stations of the Cross. Tonight we come together to remember Jesus' journey to Calvary in light of the suffering and injustice that the world faces each day. Our text is taken from the book, Mary Magdalene Stations of the Cross, and we'll hear personal reflections from friends in our community. We also remember that today is the Feast of the Annunciation, a day that women's advocates for, uh, advocates for women's ordination celebrate as um, a day for women's ordination. The feast day acknowledges when, um, mm. please, please mute. Oh. You're just talking about hospice? Please mute. This feast day acknowledges when Mary of, Ma of Nazareth um, responded to the angel Gabriel in a way saying, this is my body and this is my blood. And this cause is very uh, important to our community. So today we celebrate the Feast of the Annunciation. And let's take a few minutes of silence before we begin with song. And let's begin with Jesus, uh, <coughs> with stay with me. Stay with me, remain here with me, watch and pray, watch and pray stay with me remain with me walk here with me and pray watch and pray Stay with me, remain here with me, watch and pray, watch and pray. Station one, Jesus is condemned to death. By the time I arrive at the Praetorium, there is already a large crowd assembled. This is the place where Pontius Pilate conducts his trials when he's in Jerusalem. They are as much for show as they are for justice. But I do have hope. Perhaps the people in this crowd include many of those who welcomed us into Jerusalem last Sunday, singing praises and spreading palm leaves. Maybe they will speak out in his favor. Pilate appears and beside him stands Jesus, though I can barely recognize him. He is bloody and beaten with shackles on his wrists. Pilate addresses the crowd in keeping with tradition, I will release to you a prisoner for Passover. Which prisoner shall it be? This man, Jesus, or Barabbas? For a moment, my heart is alive with hope. Jesus, I cry out, give us Jesus. But my voice is drowned out by the crowd who yell, Barabbas. Barabbas. Pilate gives way to the mob. He orders a servant to bring him a basin of water and washes his hands dramatically. 
Then he speaks the words of condemnation that Jesus will be put to death. Jackie, you're muted. Thank you, Susie. Words translated as wilderness occur nearly 300 times in the Bible. The scriptural wilderness is a locale for intense experiences of stark need for food and water, of isolation, danger, also divine deliverance, renewal, the revelation of the divine name on Mount Sinai. There's a moment there where the word wilderness comes up. The wilderness of global poverty is overwhelming. I'm going to give a few facts so that we have something, but we know, we know, all of us know. Um, this is from World Vision. 689 million people live in extreme poverty. That's actually a category. Surviving on less than $1.90 a day. Children and youth account for two thirds of the world's poor and women represent a majority in most regions. Extreme poverty is increasingly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. About 40% of the region's people live on less than $1.90 a day. In the United States, 10.5% of the population or 34 million people live in poverty as of 2019. For an individual in the US, the poverty line is $12,880 a year. Multidimensional poverty acknowledges that poverty isn't always about income. Sometimes a person's income might be above the poverty line, but their family has no electricity, no access to a proper toilet, no clean drinking water, and no one in the family has completed six years of school. We had made some progress uh, in the world with regards to extreme poverty. But the pandemic has certainly impacted those numbers. For hope in the face of this uh, overwhelming information, there are organizations that try little by little to address these uh, one family at a time, one area at a time, geographic area. And one of them is Heifer International. That's the one that was put as a hope um, for the wilderness of Station One. For 77 years, Heifer International has invested in more than 36 million small scale farmers and their families around the world. What they do is they help people get um, possibly a heifer or a sheep or a flock of chicks, um, bees. Um, they have branched out now. Sometimes they will actually help with um, women's educational expenses in different places. And then they teach animal husbandry so that these animals are not just given uh, without the post gift support to be able to really make them useful in for that family and then for the area they live in. My family found Heifer International so many years ago at an alternative giving holiday event. Since then, we've had a couple of Christmases where we didn't give gifts to each other, but collected funds for this organization. That was no small challenge to try to talk my family into, let's think about Christmas different. But what's really fun is 
Heifer International sends out a catalog. So for so much money, you can get this beehive to a family. And it's really fun when we have done this to let the kids choose where the um, money is gonna go. When we send the money in, we tell them where it's gonna go. Um, so it has been an education for our family to know about this, to support it. And since then it's a common gift that one person will give to another for special holidays. Celebrating together, knowing that we have provided something, something small, but something has given us hope. And now we join in song with a verse of Were You There? Were you there when they sentenced him to death? Were you there when they sentenced him to death? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Tremble. Were you there when they sentenced him to death? Station two Jesus takes up his cross. Jesus is brought into the courtyard in a purple cloak. A hideous crown fashioned of thorns has been placed upon his head. It digs into his flesh and blood streams down his face. The soldiers mock him. They spit on him and slap him. I raise my eyes and pray with all my strength for some intervention from God to end all this. I have seen so many miracles and I beg for just one more. The soldiers bring the cross toward Jesus and remove his cloak. The crowd falls silent. They wait for Jesus to take up the cross. At that moment, I vow not to abandon him as so many others have done. I lack the power to stop these atrocities, but I have the power to stay and to comfort him with my presence and my love. And so the walk to Calvary begins. Pat, un unmute yourself, Pat. Thank you, sorry. A Prayer for Healthcare Workers by Rabbi Ayuet Cohen. Cohen. May the one who blessed our ancestors bless all those who put themselves at risk to care for the sick, physicians and nurses and orderlies, technicians and home health aides, EMTs and pharmacists who navigate the unfolding dangers of the world each day to tend to those they have sworn to help. Bless them in their coming home and bless them in their going out. Ease their fear, sustain them. Source of all breath, healer of all beings, protect them and restore their hope. Strengthen them that they may bring strength. Keep them in health that they may bring healing. Help them to know again a time when they can breathe without fear. Bless the sacred works work of their hands. 
May this pandemic pass from among us speedily and in our days. Amen. Just to remember your, uh, to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Station three, Jesus falls the first time. Unsteady and barefoot with the heavy cross against his shoulder, Jesus steps forward. A centurion on horseback pushes the crowds aside as they clamor to watch. Jesus is weakened from being whipped and beaten. The cross is awkward and heavy. I follow behind. Amid the crowd, I lose sight of Jesus as he turns a corner. And then I hear a commotion and race ahead, pushing my way through the on onlookers. Jesus uh, has fallen and lies on the road. Get up, the soldiers order him. In that moment, I have also fallen, not down on the street, but in my heart, for my faith is shaken. I cannot understand why God would allow this to happen. When will this torment end? Jesus struggles to his feet. He lifts the heavy cross and continues, and so do I. Um, the 12 step programs. So there are over 35. Well, there are 35 12 step programs listed on Wikipedia. And so I'm going to start with what that's all about. I'm going to read through the 12 steps and give you a little and more information. But before I start with the 12 steps, I want to just give you a quote by Richard Rohr has written a book with about using the 12 steps called breathing underwater. And he writes, we are all spiritually powerless, however, and not just those physically addicted to a substance, which is why I address this book to everyone. Alcoholics just have their powerlessness visible for all to see. The rest of us disguise it in different ways and overcompensate for our more hidden and subtle addictions and attachments, especially our addiction to our way of thinking. So in the 12 steps, step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. So substitute the word for powerlessness over anything that comes between me and God, that comes between me and you. And I can look and see how my life is unmanageable when I try to fill up the spiritual hole in my heart with something other than your love or other than what thinking about what you need. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Many people, when they come into the 12 step program, they're used to their own way of thinking, like thinking how to get out of a situation or thinking, how can I get more of this substance that numbs my feelings? Step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. And here's a side note. The steps were written in 1939. And so there's a lot of he language and there's a lot of, um, so I, I, so I, I beg your part. I just have to read what's here. Um, but that is part of the third step is that making that decision to turn my, our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. So there's a, there's a lot of freedom in this program on how we define God. And that's important because those first three steps are getting started, but you have, and um, I, I have to stop. I'm going to read the rest of the steps and I'm going to stop with my interpretation because I won't have time for all that. Um, four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to approve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Would you please join me in the serenity prayer? God, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage, the courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. I will not be done. Amen. Station four. Jesus meets his mother. There she stands, Jesus' mother, Mary. Her face is drawn with worry and creased with pain from seeing her beloved son in such distress. She steps away from the crowd and moves toward Jesus. She gazes into his eyes and leans to whisper something to him. I wonder what she said to him. What can a mother say to her son who has been betrayed, beaten, and unjustly condemned to death? Her heart must be torn in pieces, her eyes burning with tears. Yet in this moment, she radiates love and deep compassion. So I'd like to share some statistics from the sentencing project. Half of imprisoned people in the United States are parents of minor children who are under age 18. Most imprisoned parents of minor children are fathers, but a higher proportion of imprisoned women than men have minor children. 2.7 million children have a parent serving time in prison or jail on any given day, and over 5.2 million have had an incarcerated parent at some point during their lives. A large number of parents are incarcerated far from their homes, making contact with children difficult. On average, people in state prisons are 100 miles from their previous address. And in the federal prison system, the average distance between prison and home is 500 miles. Distance from prison, among other barriers, makes in-person visits difficult and in many cases, nearly impossible. Nearly all states, uh, in nearly all states, people who give birth while incarcerated are separated from their child soon. The Center for Restorative Justice works to reestablish relationships that have been torn apart by crime and the policies of the criminal justice system. It serves as a conduit to assist and accompany children, families, and communities in crossing over the barriers that separate them from people in prison. 
one sign of hope is a program that they have established called Get on the Bus. Get on the Bus trains and educates hundreds of volunteers and supporters throughout California and engages the media to raise awareness about the plight of children with a parent in prison. Get on the Bus advocates for the right of children to see, embrace, and talk to their parent who is incarcerated. Get on the bus fills more than 50 buses every year with over a thousand children from all over California to visit their mothers on the Friday before Mother's Day. And in 2006, the program started to bring children to visit their fathers in prison for Father's Day. These events not only unite families, but also inform the public of the devastation that occurs when a parent is sent to prison. A mother is still a mother to a child. A father is still a father to a child, even though they are separated by miles and prison walls. Tonight, we remember the loving relationship shared by Jesus and his mother, most especially on that road to Calvary. And we pray for all children who are separated from loved ones who are incarcerated. You can please advance to the next station. Station five, Simon helps Jesus carry the cross. <clears throat> Jesus nearly falls once more and braces against a wall to keep his balance. The centurion calls out to a man in the crowd. <clears throat> the man named Simon seems bewildered and annoyed, but the centurion's order is not to be disregarded, so he stops. He turns to Jesus and sees this terrible suffering. In that moment, Simon's heart opens to a stranger, to a prisoner condemned to death. He reaches down and helps take up the cross. Here, he says to Jesus, I will help you. How often have you used the phrase, it's my cross to bear? I know I have used it, not really appreciating that some people really, really, really have a cross to bear. I'm thinking about people who struggle to find a safe place to live. My thoughts go back to my grandmother. She was frequently abused by her husband, but when he started hitting my mom, who was seven at the time, she picked up her two youngest girls and made her way from the state of Sinaloa to Arizona. I never thought to ask, how did you cross? Did people help you? Did people you know help you? Did a stranger help you? Then my thoughts turned to the time I volunteered for Casa Cornelia Law Center in 2009. Casa Cornelia is a nonprofit law center which provides pro bono legal services to victims of human and civil rights violation. This law center has a primary commitment to the indigenous within the immigration community in Southern California. My job was to interview Spanish speaking unaccompanied minors to record their stories about their journey. I asked them why they left their home country, how they got here and who were they to see. Many friends, many families paid friends or coyotes, coyotes are smugglers, to see their children to safety, to avoid being killed recruited into gangs or raped. Some youth saw their families killed and left on their own. 
such a cross to bury. The stories were heartbreaking. They followed rivers, crossed mountains, slept under bushes, and begged along the way. Such a cross to carry. I remember the first time I asked a young person, how did you travel? The response was by train. I thought, how convenient. Then I found out the train was a freight train known as, as La Bestia, the beast. As the train would slow down, the travelers would jump on the roof, pulling each other's up. Sometimes one would fall and die or arrive in Tijuana with a broken limb. Sometimes the coyotes were, who were charged with helping these travelers took care. Most were abusive. Sometimes in cases where a person needs help, a stranger just by being there will give a piece of bread or a drink of water, maybe reluctantly, like Simon. Sometimes a stranger will consciously seek to help others. Such a person I know is Enrique Morones. I met him when I volunteered for a fundraiser for the Family Health Center in Barrio Logan. It took me a while to connect him to Luis, his brother, who was also involved in helping others and was a member of MMACC. In his book, The Power of One, Enrique refers to the story of the starfish. The father asks his son, why did you throw that starfish back into the ocean? There are so many. Does it matter? The son replied, it matters to that one. Thus, Enrique took it upon himself to get a group of individuals, which they became known as border angels. These individuals, strangers, went into the canyons of North County to help the farm workers. Then they went to the desert to distribute water for the travelers who were dying of thirst. Most of the time, the travelers were unaware of the treacherous condition of mountains and desert. Border angels were strangers, helping others carry their cross. Enrique felt anguish. He felt compassion. One of the stories he tells about is about Marco Antonio Villaseñor. Marco was a five-year-old boy who crossed for the number one reasons that migrants who are come crossing from Latin America have today, economic opportunity. He crossed with his dad and some other men. They were heading for Houston where they had a job lined up. They were going to have a smuggler take them to Houston in the back of a truck. There were about 80 people in that truck and they soon ended up in Victoria, Texas. Marco Antonio became very thirsty and desperate. So he asked his dad for some water, but his dad didn't answer. He asked the next man and the next man. but nobody could answer. He asked the 18 men around him for water, but none of the 18 men were able to give this little boy what he needed. The reason was that his father and all the other men had already died. Then Marco Antonio Villasenor also died near Victoria, Texas in May, 2003. When authorities and the driver finally opened up the semi truck, there were 80 people in the back of the truck and 19 of them, including the little boy were dead. There are many groups in San Diego and elsewhere helping immigrants. Strangers helping strangers carry their cross. One can look online for groups
helping immigrants. The hope is in the many individuals in their organizations who help families with shelter, food, warm showers, and assistance to get to their destination. We as a community contributed clothing for asylum seekers to reach their destination. You know, we don't like to say out loud or announce when we help a stranger, but we must be aware that we help us when we help a stranger, we are giving hope. So we must not give up hope, but persevere. On March 19th, the CDC officially lifted the order that allowed the public health policy, Title 42, to deny accompanied children crossing the border the chance to seek asylum. This is a bit of hope. Enrique says, love has no borders. I say, share the love. Let us join in singing whatsoever you do. Whatsoever you do to the least of my people that you do unto me. When I was weary, you helped me find rest. When I was anxious, you calmed all my fears. Now enter into the home of the one God. Whatsoever you do to the least of my people that you do on to me. Station six, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. A doorway opens and a woman steps out into the street. She is startled by the wretched sight before her. Jesus, bruised and bloody, struggling to walk. The woman pauses to take it all in. She meets his gaze and sees his anguish and cannot bring herself to turn away. She wants to help, but seems unsure of what to do. She reaches up, takes the veil from her hair, folds it, and hands it to Jesus so that he may use it to wipe the blood and sweat from his face. She waits patiently as he does so, hoping that this moment will offer a brief respite from his pain. It is a small mercy. Even the soldiers are moved and the crowd is hushed. Then she returns to the doorway and goes back inside. The wilderness that accompanies this station is terminal illness. And surely all of us have walked with somebody in that journey. It is um, pretty terrifying um, in so many ways and um, we can thank Dame Cicely Saunders, uh, who was from England in 1967, creating a, a new way for end of life care called hospice. She had the thought that usually dying people are in pain, they are over medicated, and they cannot interact with others, thereby losing the last months or weeks of their lives to pain medication. And she wanted to find an alternative to this care. In the 1980s, this kind of healthcare came to the United States and it was spurred on, of course, by 
uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book on deaf and dying. In the 1990s, it became an official medical specialty, just like pediatrics or oncology. We're all going to die. No one likes to think or talk much about the details. It's hard to see a loved one go through the dying process. Often people do not want to contact hospice and get this kind of care because they have to face the fact that their loved one is truly dying. They see calling in hospice as a giving up. But the ironic thing is that often the patient lives longer with hospice care because it is targeted to help with the very specialized psychosocial, spiritual, and physical needs of the dying, and often the family, with the single focus of patient comfort rather than cure, there is a possibility of quality time during this difficult and challenging letting go rather than giving up. I came to think of hospice care as midwifing people into their next life. We don't know for sure about the next life, but I chose choose to believe that the dying person is completing something here and that there is a promise of eternity. So there's a completing and a preparing for the new. There are at least 25 hospice care organizations in San Diego, for-profit and non-profit. And Medicare covers this um, specialized medicine. In the 1990s, at some point, I needed to take a break from the activism that I'd been involved with, you know, where I'm like trying to deal with large organizations and um, um, create change. I was burned out, but I knew I needed to do something in the community. So I signed up to volunteer with San Diego Hospice. And that way I could be helpful one person at a time, maybe. The training was outstanding, very intense. Everything was focused on the comfort of the patient with whom we were assigned. So this was not a time to talk a lung cancer patient out of smoking or to evangelize our own spiritual path. Though as volunteers, our careful listening might support the patient in exploring their own spiritual path or meaning. I had some very beautiful experiences during these years, but two stand out, and I'm gonna share them with you. I had a patient uh, in Point Loma, and she was a little tiny person, and she had, some, I, I don't know what kind of cancer, but the tumor was in her neck, so she normally wouldn't get chemotherapy, but she would get chemotherapy for comfort because it would, uh, make the tumor smaller. So therefore she did not have, like she only had little wisps of hair. And I must've helped her to the bathroom at one point. And we were looking in the mirror and she said to me, do you think I'm still beautiful? And I thought, and of course I told her she was because in fact, you know, she was, um, but she was beautiful. Uh, inside and out at that moment to me because she was so vulnerable. And that's something that happens uh, wonderfully in those dying months and weeks and days is the person shares often their most vulnerable and, and with strangers um, because for all intents and purpose, I was a stranger. And the other wonderful experience I had, I had a patient who had lasted like for a long time, uh, a couple of years at least. And um, he was crotchety, he was younger than me. He was in a skilled nursing facility. And, um, and, and then he passed. And at least two years later, I get a call from somebody and, they, and it was a man and he said, uh, who are you, who were you in the life of this patient? And uh, I said, I was a hospice volunteer. 
and we started to talk about this patient, but I'm still not sure like what's going on. It turns out that this was uh, the patient's sweetheart and he was calling, he was missing his guy and he was calling all the people in the phone book um, of my patient to try to just make that connection two years after his death, um, you're still grieving. There's something really hopeful about this phase of our lives when we can give that kind of individual care to the patient and the family uh, during such a difficult time. Station seven, Jesus falls the second time. We continue along the road uphill toward the city gates. More women have joined the crowd following along behind, weeping and lamenting. These women, I believe, may have been among those who welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem last Sunday. How very long ago that day seems now. That was a day of triumph, a day of pure joy. Now, only five days later, the same person they greeted with cheers has become a condemned prisoner. Today, the crowd jeers and mocks Jesus. How quickly everything can change in this world in only five days. Jesus has slowed his pace and I move forward from the rear of the crowd. I am almost behind Simon now as we reach the city gates. But then Jesus falls again. A wilderness in the field of education. Every day, girls face barriers to education, amplified by poverty, cultural norms, poor infrastructure, violence, and gender bias in the classroom and the workforce. But girls' education goes beyond getting girls into school. It's about ensuring that they learn and feel safe while they're there that they have the opportunity to complete all levels of education, gain workforce skills, as well as the life skills necessary to navigate our world. It's about empowering them to make decisions about their own lives and to contribute to their communities in the world. Both individuals and countries benefit from girls' education. Better educated women tend to be more informed about nutrition and healthcare, marry at a later age, have fewer children, and those children they do have are usually healthier. They're more likely to participate in the labor market and earn higher incomes. And all these factors combined help lift households, communities, and even countries out of poverty. And enrollment rates are actually um, much more similar for primary school than they used to be. In fact, two thirds of all countries have reached gender parity in enrollment, which is a huge accomplishment. But completion rates for girls are lower in low income countries and the gender gap completion rate skyrockets for young women who enroll in secondary and higher education. However, even when girls are in school, they often face a lack of support at home from teachers and administrators who are increasingly male as a young person progresses in school into secondary and university levels. And even from books and textbooks that stereotype women into support roles or fail to include the significant accomplishments of women in the history of their nation, religion, or culture which Mary Magdalene has done much to rectify in our own Catholic history. 
And in our time, COVID has caused major loss of attendance in schools at all education levels and among all genders. And the U.S. has not been immune to this. The COVID pandemic has widened pre-existing opportunity and achievement gaps, hitting historically disadvantaged students the hardest. On average, they ended remote learning with almost a half a year of what they're calling unfinished learning in all subject areas. And perhaps even more painfully, students' mental and emotional health have deteriorated significantly. And families, even those who have both the courage and the resources to seek help, face extremely long wait times to access care when their kids are most vulnerable. So where do we look for help? One of the bright lights in ongoing efforts to normalize and elevate education for girls is Malala Yousafzai, the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize winner. Born in Pakistan, where she was forbidden to attend school, she actually spoke out and advocated for girls' education. And as you know, she was shot by the Taliban as a result of that. But after her recovery, she went back to school, eventually enrolling in Oxford University, where she continues to champion educational opportunities for girls, particularly in nations where access is often difficult, if not denied. And in our own country, where women have largely achieved enrollment and graduate graduation parity, female students and students of all genders still face heartbreaking challenges and need support. And I believe we can look at the work of brave activists whose vulnerability and courage inspires girls, women, and people of all ages to persevere in the face of great obstacles. We can look to Tarana Burke, the founder of the hashtag Me Too movement, which she pioneered while a school counselor and social worker. She met her students and their experiences of sexual harassment and assault with deep empathy, compassion, and ultimate solidarity. In 2017, her Me Too movement changed the cultural conversation around the world empowering people to speak up and speak out, throwing off millennia of secrecy and shame. We can also look to Emma Gonzalez, a Stoneman Douglas High School shooting survivor, who now goes by X Gonzalez, who has gone on to become a vocal advocate for gun control. They went back to school and now attend college in Florida. But even as a teenager, they gave voice to victims of gun violence everywhere when they shouted, we call BS to the adults who continually fail to this day to protect school children by standing up to gun manufacturers and for common sense gun safety. And finally, I offer the hopeful light of Robin Wall Kimmerer an enrolled member of the citizen Patawatomi Nation. She is a distinguished professor of botany and forest biology. She is also the best-selling author of Braiding Sweetgrass, which many of us have read. So in addition to supporting quality education for Native children, her very self and her very work exposes and elevates the much needed wisdom of Indigenous peoples in our nation and hopefully throughout the world. So we pray, Jesus, your education took place in the wilderness. You were led by the spirit to ever deepening knowledge of yourself and of God to greater maturity and confidence. You came out of the wilderness and brought light and hope to the world. And so we pray for all students all over the world that they too may be sustained by the Spirit in the wilderness of their schooling years. And like you, show us the way forward. Amen. Thank you all for participating tonight. We close tonight with Station 7. And we'll begin again with Station 8 on, the, on April 8th. 
So I invite you all to join us again for stations then. If we could close with um, a chorus of Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Thank you to all our presenters and speakers tonight. Have a good evening and rest well.